Adams from the Climate Development Knowledge Network. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I guess this question's for the whole panel. Are there decision-making tensions for those drawing up the long-term development plans for developing countries between conventional models, grid improvements, and off-grid solutions? And if so, how can they be managed? I'm going to take a couple of questions. So. You in the blue, and then... My name's Anya Boyd from Engineers Without Borders. I have a question. You're talking about the disparity between where the coal is being extracted and who has energy access in those regions, and we're talking specifically around coal. But we also know that in countries like South Africa, where they're extending the renewable energy program, that that's no different. You've got the grid lines running across communities with no access to electricity, and that doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. So I think also just to say, you know, what do we do about that? It's not just coal that's, that's having that phenomena. Stephen Kokoris, uh, SOAS. So uh, in America, you see uh, a trend of uh, coal to gas conversion to many uh, power plants. Uh, I would like to know what's the feasibility of bringing uh, these conversions from coal plants to either natural gas or biofuel to reduce the dependence on coal while meeting demand in developing countries. Um, I think we'll stop there and, and, and circle back on some of these. Uh, do any panels want to, these are all uh, appear to be general questions to the panel. So. Anyone wants to start? Uh, maybe the last. Uh, I, I'd say there are no tensions because off-grid is so neglected. Um, <laughs> it, it just is a fact. But having, having been, I'll be more... Um, <laughs> and this is where public finance and public finance that delivers what it says. And many of the World Bank and many of the development banks produce fantastic reports on climate, fantastic reports on energy access, innovative solutions, but... They don't actually deliver them. They don't really, in, you know, they say don't deliver. They don't deliver them to scale, and and re that's one motivation. But you also look at positive countries. I think of, of not so much for, but I understand the Ghana, but certainly Nepal, countries whose governments understand decentralised, you know, realise that the access to the grid is going to be limited. Have prioritised it. I mean, Nepal's not perfect, but it's got a lot of microhydro. It's got a lot of innovative energy there is, is one. So a government that produces a good plan to help deliver, along with the finance being available, um, can actually stimulate that growth. So it's not impossible. It just needs to be prioritised. Um, I want the coal to gas to, to, to solution. The ga gas is an, an interesting one. Um, I think it's... I think the, the rich countries can rapidly get ourselves off gas. If we're entrenching gas in, the, in this country, then uh, we have to reduce almost to zero carbon energy very, very soon. So we really need to think about that, that trend. Developing countries, um, there's probably a good re re reason for using it. My experience, a lot of gas in developing countries is developed for export rather than because they have to pay back their loan. That's the best way of getting, paying back your, your, your loan again is it, uh, delivering access. So, you, again, you have to be very, very specific in what you're using it for. But globally, by mid-century, we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. So I think if there were much more strategic planning, risk assessments around these things, they could be done in a very controlled way. And looking at alternatives, not just the conventional, from now on, um, would, would start just be open, openly discussing it, um, really, for developing countries. So, so, yeah, in terms of your, was it Leo, in terms of your question, I think that, that is, that's a really good question. I think it shows where a lot of the effort needs to go is at the national level in developing countries. So as they're developing, you know, their NDCs um, and looking at SDG implementation, I think there's, a, there's actually a real need for support for kind of a national public discussion around different energy pathways, not just for access, but also for e power for economic development. Um, and, you know, also support for kind of evidence and research. So, um, because I think a, a lot of, in, in ministries, I think a lot of the, a lot of the officials, some, you know, in, in many countries do get um, the need to move to cleaner energy pathways, et cetera. Obviously, there are the political barriers, and we talk about some of those in the report in terms of vested interests that will be in the way of utility reform, et cetera. 
Um, but I do think there is there is a real role for development partners, donors, to support, as I say, this evidence gathering, the national public discussion, um, and also obviously for te for technical assistance, technology transfer, etc., to support countries to show that there really is, you know, support for them to the countries that want to go down the cleaner energy pathways that you know, they're going to be able to access the technology, they're going to be able to kind of do it. So I think that's, you know, it's not just about, you know, national um, governments that are developing, you know, in developing countries not wanting to do the right thing. <laughs> I think there's just a real lack of support, policy advice, etc. And the more that, that, you know, that's a real role that development partners can like the UK can play. Um, and just on the Labour from Engineers Without Borders, I think that's that's a really important point. And I think what we're, what we're saying, and I think what we tried to say was that just this issue of just adding generating capacity, adding capacity to the grid, whether that's from coal or renewables, is not necessarily going to reach SDG 7. So it's not going to deliver energy access. So if you're talking about centralised grid, you know, you need to be focusing really on connecting people and on reforming trans, trans, uh, transmission and distribution and solving those problems, basically, to get to people. Um, and then, obviously, in terms of, you know, generating grid power, again, I think, you know, if you, it's, how, it's supporting countries to be able to have a renewable-based grid, you know, or, and a smart grid, et cetera, and helping them to solve the storage issues and all those kinds of things, basically. So that's more in terms of general sort of power, power for development more than, more than energy access. Just to follow up on, um, I think, uh, your question around, um, you know, having power lines run over uh, uh, villages without access to energy um, close to power plants, and the question around tensions between different planning priorities are uh, a really related question. Uh, the risk in my mind is that you, um, uh, that we um, deliver energy access on paper and not in reality. Um, the electrification of a village does not deliver energy services to all the people in the village. And many governments will um, characterize in inferred access um, as uh, their target. So by building capacity, you can divide the the nameplate capacity of a power plant by the number of houses that it could power, and then say, well, we've delivered access. Or even say we've connected a village to the grid, and therefore we've delivered access. But it takes decades um, before uh, power delivered to a village turns into connection to individual households, because the individual connections are very expensive. What, what does that mean in practice? It means that serious plans for access must target actual delivery of energy services, clean, modern, safe, reliable, sustainable services to households rather than inferred connections, whether they be grid-wide inferred connections or even at the sort of village or community level. Um, there is a real tension there because governments are going to want to show with a 2030 goal that they can meet that goal very quickly. So they'll say, we're going to do this by 2020, we're going to do this by 2025. Um, but without having the capacity and the political ambition to actually measure delivery of energy services to human beings, we won't see that happen. So that is, there is a tension around access on that issue. And on power for industry and uh, growth and development, which is very dependent on the grid, um, planning for a renewable heavy system is different than planning for um, a 20th century grid. And so where the tension is, is do governments take into account all of the available um, technologies that exist now um, at the prices that they exist now and at the prices they exist when they will be developed? And um, failing to do that actually risks um, building the wrong system. And so there are tensions around, even from the broader energy demands beyond access, um, for other aspects of the economy, for planning for the wrong system. So I would just flag those two as the tensions. On gas, I, do, I don't want to let that kind of sneak by. We didn't focus on um, existing capacity in developing countries. Um, there is relatively little coal in terms of the total global installed capacity in developing countries outside of uh, China. Um, when, you, when you look at the total fleet of coal-fired capacity in, in, in the globe. 
So we didn't focus on that issue. And the question about retrofitting plants, it depends on the technology that's applied. It can be very expensive. Um, but um, the fact is, regardless of that, the planned capacity is enormous. So we really focused on why would we start building out more coal-fired capacity given, given the circumstances, and particularly at the scale that's planned now. I just want to add Please. something. Um, this tension that you just described is even bigger if you consider that um, no matter what are the agreements that the states have made in the past under the climate um, discussions, but in this moment, they are actually expanding the border of the exploitation of coal. At least that is what's happening in my country. And perhaps in paper they say, okay, we, we will try to achieve these goals by 2025. But in fact, they are getting new agreements for uh, ex expand the coal exploitation for 50 or, th for, for 50 or 30, 30 years from this moment to the future. So what does uh, um, new things leave us to pursue cleaner energies? In five decades, Colombia will be considered these real situations, or in five decades, we will face the very same problems that we are facing now. So what is the real will of our states in this issue when they are planning these new operations based in coal, uh, and when they are in the other part saying that, yes, they, are, they agree at least to achieve these goals under the climate uh, discussions. So the, the tension is quite bigger. We do another round of questions with your hands. Um, Aaron, um, you, and you will just start this little. I'll come back over here in the next round. Thanks, Sami. Um, I just wanted to also say that, uh, so my name is Aaron Leopold from Practical Action. We're very proud to be uh, part of, of the 12 organizations that- They're one of the 12. Paper. Yeah, we're one of the 12. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I couldn't agree more with the, the comments that Ilmi and, and Sarah made about kind of capacities and planning at the national level, because one of the major issues that we've found in our advocacy work um, is that, you know, there's, there's on the one hand kind of the, the big bad coal industry, but on, then on the other hand, there's the national utilities, ministries, and regulators that simply don't know how much things have changed in the past uh, 10 years or so, and are really uh, kind of unaware of the, the possibility to do more and different things with their, their energy systems. Um, and I think this has to be kind of one of the major pushes that we, that we take away from, from this exercise is that, you know, clearly, you know, the evidence is there, but kind of finding the right levers to, to how to activate and act on this knowledge is, is really, really fundamental. And so I really look forward to working together with everyone on the panel and in this room on, on trying to figure out how, ways how to communicate those things. Uh, and especially because uh, we in the advocacy world know that it's very difficult to fundraise for advocacy. So how, if, if all the evidence is there and you know, the, the, it's, a, it's a capacity gap, you know, how do we change those mindsets and educate those decision makers? And I wasn't going to do this, but since two of you addressed the, the question of you know, how, what, what role does this play in energy planning and how can we do energy planning differently? The a report that we also just launched, the Poor People's Energy Outlook. You're welcome. Uh, two to weeks ago. <laughs> totally fine addresses that exact issue, looking at energy planning from the bottom up. And I'll put a couple of these out on the lunch table later on, so thanks. Um, Rebecca Williams from WWF UK. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all for, for the report. I think it's a really useful contribution to the debate, and particularly the energy access um, question is something that we come up against all the time in our work, so thank you for that. My question was actually about the UK coal phase out in the global context. Um, it's been alluded to already, but I just wanted um, the panelists' thoughts on what role that, that phase out can play in changing the global narrative in developing countries and perhaps moving that debate on to a coal phase out in those countries. Um, hi there, yeah, thank you for the uh, presentations. Um, Dario Kenner, independent researcher. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on something that Joanna mentioned, which was about, um, in a way, a criteria for energy, that it should not lead to human rights violations. And also to connect to the question uh, about uh, 
renewable energy grids not actually providing access. So maybe looking ahead, which is what I tend to do, I'm an optimist and I believe that all this great work about beyond coal at some point, governments will listen and hopefully MDVs and World Bank, etc. Um, I mean, there are also practical issues like the fact that the cost of renewable energy has come down so much that cannot be ignored. At some point, hopefully, there will be a massive rollout of renewable energy. I mean, the countries like India and China have already have big ambitions for that. So how can renewable energy, we're talking about particularly decentralized and so off-grid and mini-grid, how can it be designed so it actually leads to energy access but also doesn't lead to human rights violations? Mm -hmm. I just feel that there's an assumption made, um, maybe particularly by the fossil fuel divest movement, which are focusing on divesting the money. Obviously, that's what needs to happen. And here today, we're talking about all of the bad things to do with coal. Those are clear, but there's, an, there's less focus on what actually happens when all that re renewable energy is actually built, where it's built. Mm -hmm. For example, that could lead to displacement or not. Mm -hmm. And so how can it be designed in a way that um, is good for communities and also good for the environment? Happy. <laughs> I, th I mean, I think the impact, the UK started the Industrial Revolution, coal drove that Industrial Revolution for the UK to announce that it is going to end coal uh, power in the UK, I think has to have an impact. We have to make sure it has an impact when it happens. We're going into the COP next week, COP22 in Marrakesh. And during the COP, there'll be a dialogue on pre-2020 emissions reductions, what we have to do right now. And I think the rich countries want to focus on developing countries, what they can do. We can give them finance or technology. They'll do it over there. And I think the more we can push the, the, the rich countries, the UK, US, all these countries, into actually admitting they need to do more now, it would be absolutely fantastic. And um, if the UK, if the minister... Um, Nick Hurd could say that, that the coal phase out would start at, you know, COP would give a real positive, um, we're doing it first. That's what always the developing countries come back. Why should we do it when you're not? And it's really giving confidence in that negotiations, for example, would be really, really, so I support that hugely. <laughs> they are be, uh, they're making some pressure on me <laughs> in this last issue. Okay. Um, that it's a great question because I think that is the question that could us lead you lead a, that could lead us to real changes, and uh, I don't have all the answer. I just perhaps have some indicators to to pursue a real answer. The first thing that comes to my mind is um, we really need diagnosis not only about what have made the coal industry in the territories, but also what other sources of energy have created in the territories as well. So we have evidence to know what is, going, what is really going on in these territories in order to what? To re rehabilitate the territories, because people need a place to stay in, especially rural communities. Um, and that would be amazing if we could create. I, I, I'm also an optimistic in what humans can create, you know. So um, that could give us some hints on what we can design, what could, what can we create that not cause that or that could not cause the very same impact um, that brings this kind of destruction to these areas. That would be one one step. The second one was uh, would be. Uh, the whole rehabilitation thing, it's not only the environmental rehabilitation of the territories, but also the social and economic rehabilitation for the uh, population. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps if we think that the sources to create energy could involve also the communities um, in, in this path to pursue another, another way to, to, to satisfy not only the global demand of energy, but also the needs of the populations in their territories, that would be something that could make us invent, create something different that we have in this moment. And um, in Tierra Igna, we does believe a lot, we do believe a lot in something that we call environmental order. We need to organize the territory 
in an environmental perspective, but also in a cultural and in a, in, in a people perspective. And uh, if we do that, if we order not only the countries in, in development process, on, but also the other countries, we could know in what areas, what kind of activity could be a good activity and what other activity could be perhaps a, a bad one. So if we could advance in the order of the territories with a environmental perspective, perhaps that could help us to design energies, proper energies or proper source of energy, um, depending on the characteristic of the territories and not only uh, in the uh, demand of the global population about uh, energy sources. So uh, that could be perhaps three points that we might find useful in order to design in the future. <laughs> I, I expect that future could be more soon that uh, uh, away <laughs> uh, for us. But yes, uh, that would be at least three points uh, to start thinking about it. Just to, to um, just come back to Aaron's comment, I, I completely agree with you, and I think I think often the, the human capacity and institutional capacity issues are really underestimated at the um, in, de in developing countries. So again, um, there needs to be a lot more support going going into that, um, and also I think that's a huge issue at at the MDBs, and I think that's one of the reasons why we continue to get investment in in fossil fuels. Um, you know, it's clear that the, the human capacity, the skill sets, and the internal <coughs> incentives are not still there at the MDBs to make sure that there is more investment in renewables um, and energy access. And I thought it's interesting that the, um, the, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has just is about to pro is, is, is producing um, an energy sector um, strategy. Um, they've agreed to have a public consultation around it, which I think is really important. And in the issues note they, they've, um, they've developed as the first part of the consultation, um, they actually single out the fact that they feel that they have a lack of, inter of, of internal capacity and skills um, to, to make them kind of fit for purpose for, for meeting their overarching objectives, which are basically implementation of Paris and, um, well, they, not, not SDG 7, they have um, sustainable energy for all um, as, as their kind of overarching objectives. So I think that, that was, that's very interesting and telling, I think. Um, so I think the more that's recognised by the MDBs themselves, but I also think that's something for donors like the UK, again, to try and work on um, and to be championing, is making sure that there are those right skill sets within, you know, both within bilateral institutions like DFID, but also in multilateral development banks. Um, on the point, the uh, point from the lady from WWF, um, and Alison obviously um, has answered that as well, I think it's really important for social justice issues, but also in terms of the UK being able to take a credible, credible and proactive position within like international cold, cold diplomacy, which is kind of what they should be doing, I think, to move to the coal phase as, as soon as possible. Um, I think at the national level, I think it can be much more problematic. And I actually think that it, it should be, it's got to be national organizations that take the lead basically um, on, on those sort of discussions um, and decision-making processes. We have um, obviously, um, we're very pleased to have our southern partners on the report. Um, ISR, for example, one of our partners from, from Indonesia um, made this point very forceful, forcefully to me that you know, in terms of how they interact with government um, and other stakeholders, that very much they need to be looking at what are the you know what are the alternatives to coal for Indonesia, and they need to be looking at holistically at national energy pathways, and that's the way that you will get change. So I, th I think that's that's a really important point to to keep in mind. Um, in terms of Daria's question, I think that was that's complete com was completely bang on in terms of how do you make sure that that energy access projects actually do deliver in terms of reliable, sustainable, affordable services for communities. And at CAFOD, we think there needs to be a much more demand-focused approach to energy access. And by that, I mean there needs to be much more attention and investment going into making sure that services are designed and delivered um, to meet end users' actual needs on the ground, and that those will vary between different country contexts, different socio-cultural contexts. But unless we really take that seriously, then 
basically we won't build understanding amongst those communities of these new renewable services and products that are available. Um, but beyond that, we services won't basically meet end users' development needs. So actually this kind of people-centred approach to how you design and deliver services is not a nice add-on thing to have. It's actually absolutely crucial in making sure that you do deliver energy access on the ground. Um, so and just something that I think the lady from Engineers Without Borders, you, this kind of speaks to your points as well about I, I think there is um, there is a kind of growing consensus that you know we the current definitions of energy access you know are not sort of working so the idea of you know basic household access you know to electricity connection um, you know there are a lot of um, donors there's a whole for example discussion at the World Bank on sustainable energy all, for all initiative about something called the global tracking framework so that's really trying to say we need to kind of be measuring access um, in terms of the sort of the different attributes of an energy service. So we need to be looking at, you know, is energy, is, are we delivering, you know, reliable, um, safe, legal, et cetera, affordable, et cetera, services. So focusing again on the sort of usability of, of the energy aspect. And that's really positive, I think. Um, and I think the more we can support that, as you know, as development organisations, and the more we can get our governments to support that, the better. And they, the World Bank, I think, is going to be carrying out surveys of looking at the level of real energy access using that kind of framework. So looking at the different different tiers of access and look at those different qualities of an energy service. I think they're going to be rolling that out in quite a few countries. So that will, should help in terms of actually, you know, seeing are we on track to meet to meet SDG seven. So just on the. Um issue of how much things have changed. Um, just a sort of personal anecdote is that uh, I was a practicing energy and infrastructure lawyer in the late 2000s when the clean energy boom in the US was really taking off. Um, this is like 2007, 2008, 2009. I mean, really enormous numbers of new capacity being built, amount of investment going into that. Um, prices in the US since that time have declined by 80% for solar and 60% for wind since 2009. Um, so I'm an apologist by nature. I would say I am, I am completely sympathetic with how hard it is for, um, for uh, uh, institutions within both developed and developing countries to keep up with the rate of change. I mean, you have in South Africa, um, uh, they plan these two, these two enormous coal-fired power plants haven't been built yet. They're already 17% more expensive than the wind uh, power that, that uh, South Africa is bringing online now. Um, so it is not an easy problem, but we don't want to uh, aim for something less ambitious that is broken as a, as a power system, um, rather than aiming for something that will actually work, even though it is incredibly challenging. So, so I, there, it is a difficult issue um, to, to make sense of that. The, the Asian, Asian Development Bank example is a really interesting one because planning for um, human capacity to deliver this is, is really hard and making sure you're not building stuff based on what people are familiar with as an incumbent technology rather than, um, rather than the current technology is, is, is really a challenge. This is not to say, this paper isn't to say, oh, it's easy. Um, it's to acknowledge uh, where the opportunities now lay. Um, one more round of questions, I think. I'll start with this side of the room and give, give a chance. Um, you and then Dan. Um, hi, my name is Shalu. I'm a student at UCL, but uh, before coming here, I was working with Council on Energy, Environment, Water, which is one of the partner groups, I yep. guess. Yeah, and uh, I complete, I've been working with Renewable Energy team there, but I would like to play a bit of a devil's advocate here. Like uh, mo almost all of the energy modeling uh, exercises in India suggest that even in 2050, coal will continue to be the base power. Just because of the fact that our energy demand will more than double, we have constraints, like we don't have oil and gas, so there are concerns of import dependency, and renewables cannot certainly be the base power. Like, well, something would depend on how the batteries evolve, but, but then how do we sell the idea of not building more capacity to the political leaders then. Hmm. And a small uh, second question that, which is from like a decentralized point of view, that renewable energy power is not equi equivalent to grid power. So often people who don't have energy access, if, they give, if they're asked, they would want to have a grid power because it can be scaled up. So 
even if you give decentralized power, their aspirations rise. So how, how, how will you continue to meet them going forward? Dan? So this is an interesting theme we're on. Going back to Aaron's question and then the panel's comment and then your question about you know, how do you help people, planners in agencies who by definition have to be risk averse. Mm -hmm. They get no credit for enabling the switch that happens a decade after they're retired and they will be strung up and flayed if there's a lack of power. And so as much as someone said, oh, it's hard to raise money for advocacy, I'm hoping there's a few others in the room, but I don't see a lot. So my lab actually builds those models. And I'd love to see hands, who else builds truly detailed power sector models? I mean, ones that, not a spreadsheet in Excel that you can show your friends, but <laughs> ones that you can show someone who actually works in the utility, ESCOM, EGAT, Kenya Power, anybody here. So that, that's the scariest comment for me today. <laughs> My lab has built models for the Chinese five regional grids, for ESCOM, for the Kenyan grid, for Kosovo, for Chile, for Western United States. And these are incredibly hard to do, not because the maths are that hard. There's a little bit of trick there, but because the data is secretive. So much so that when I wanted to build the model for the United States as an official representative of the United States government, I was denied the data. <laughs> and we had to do what's called a Freedom of Information Act. It took three years to get the data that President Obama said I was required to have. Now, I know right now the United States is in a bit of an email war, and so there may be a few reasons. But I just want to highlight how hard this is. And so when Kenya says we need our power uh, supply to grow by 22% a year for 10 years, or India says we have to have these huge numbers, it's not somehow you know, a lost in translation in terms of how to do it. Modelers are never going to be the, the sharp end of the spear in making this transition. Because if I walk in with a model that's better or worse, it's apples to oranges. The agencies have a model. They know how it works, or maybe they think they know how it works, but they, they know how to turn the crank. And if I walk in with a model that's better or worse, there's no point of comparison. So we can build a tool, but they have to be ready for the tool. And something that people who do advocacy can do is turn this tension, this fighting with utilities on its head and say, you know, we have examples of other countries where this kind of process has gone on. So I'd love to turn it around to all of you to say, imagine all those meetings you've gone to with utilities, and it was all about trying to convince them solar is 22% cheaper than coal. It means nothing. It's risk, and it's the transmission, and the distribution, all of these naughty details. And getting planners ready for that is, I think, the hardest part of the story. And so we can build them. And the ratio of builders here to advocates is not good. But getting people ready for that message is something that we're not going to do, that you guys do. Yeah. I, I, um I did some work with, with Cl uh, Climate Action Network South Asia and, and India last year and, and again with Srinivas. Um, we, we assessed what India could achieve in terms of its NDCs, Nationally Determined Contribution to, to India. And then we assessed how they could deliver it. Um, it, it was, it's a Can South Asia report, the uh, India's Triple Challenge, if you want to look at that. And I think um, to deliver it, it was power sector, yes. If you actually deliver your renewables investment and what have you, but it was also looking at the other sectors, industry, transport, household, commercial. And if they looked at, if they actually delivered the commitments the government have made on energy efficiency in each of those, it takes them well towards, and in fact beyond delivering the NDC, the emission reduction targets the India has set themselves. So I think um, it's also a case of looking at the, the energy consumption, energy use, energy efficiencies, and delivery as a, as a whole um, is um, it was so. Um, if you're interested in that, that's that was produced by by Indian Indian partners. I, you know, it wasn't something I sort of enforced. It's really just looking at delivering the own strategies or reducing the consumption needs, or at least being much much more efficient in how they use it. 
Um, it's interesting, again, in India, I, I've had the answer, we can't build small scale because we can't then sink it into the grid when, you know, cost efficiencies. This is a, an argument. I, if I build a micro hydro, a small hydro, or I build a, a little mini grid here, when the grid comes along, it'll take over and I can't synchronise it in. And that's, again, because the grid system is so old, creaking, un, you know, unreliable, varying. So I think that, again, it's a holistic, it's taking that bigger. But the other side is, do you deny someone off the grid that immediate supply of energy as opposed to later on? I, I, th I think it has to be come from both sides. Um, just to follow up, um, to sort of merge Dan's observation and your question about India, um, maybe one of the ways to start thinking about our projections and modeling to kind of shift the conversation to um, from apples to oranges, if you will, to, to new approaches to that modeling or to question the existing ones is to look at the existing modeling towards the needed supply in India and the fact that existing coal capacity is being used at a lower and lower utilization rate. Uh, the, the capacity factors are now below 60% um, and, and, and 56, is that what it is now? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you look at the next me mega project that's likely to get built in Gujarat, which is an already oversupplied state. So, so there, what that indicates is that clearly there's something wrong with the modeling. Now, maybe that is that the growth targets um, that, that are part of the National Development Plan that sort of project out enormous um, growth rates for the economy across all regions um, are politically um, very appetizing but unrealistic about who will purchase that new power. Um, that's a difficult conversation to have, but clearly those projections are not, are proving out to be inaccurate. So it's flipping, flipping that around um, and, 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 and sort of saying, well, clearly there's a problem here. So how do we model this in a way that actually reflects um, demand rather than supply. Um, to highlight this, I mean, what hypothesis about what's driving these objectives is that you have a mining sector in India that is um, looking for a market. And, um, and, and what you see, if you look at each of the countries that are really turning towards coal, particularly in the developing world, that are turning towards coal as a viable energy alternative, including countries that didn't necessarily rely on it historically, like Colombia, for power supply. In a lot of cases, it's countries where they're struggling to find demand for their, for their, um, for their national mines. And so this presents an opportunity domestically to meet a political economic challenge for their um, coal production. And so it, just drawing that link together is, is pretty important. There are definitely political economic factors that drive a, a, a very supply-heavy model because you want to figure out who you can sell coal to. Um, that's a, a powerful interest. So I think we're um, – oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No, I'm glad you had it. No, I just want to, to chip in on, uh, uh, on in terms of your, your question. Um, I mean, I – I mean, I, don't, I mean, the way we've, we've broached this question here is very much, obviously, if we can connect people to the grid, if that grid is, is reliable, gives you reliable service, affordable service, et cetera, um, great. But even as a stopgap, to get into the 2030 goal, we're not going to get there in terms of Africa, for example, grid extension is not keeping up with population growth. You talk to people who are connected to the grid, even when they can afford to be connected, that is not a reliable, affordable um, service that gives them a, a level of power they can use appli their appliances and all the rest of it, basically. So to deny, to, you know, to deny people <laughs> access to a level of energy, even if it's not huge, you know, and say in favour of holding off to extend them to some grid, mythical grid connection, which may never come, I think is not, uh, from our position, is not a social justice kind of answer. I would just say that. Um, and then I think in terms of the whole, the, the whole planning discussion, I do think, again, it comes back to the issue of, you know, the need for perhaps a more bottom-up um, approach to planning. So if you actually looked at what the demand is for, for en of energy needs of, of particular communities, et cetera, I mean, not, not just for economic development, but on the access side, then you might have more realistic um, scenarios, basically, planning scenarios. And it was very interesting when we, we, we 
um, had some interaction with the Indonesian government recently, and they were really struggling with this issue of the, like, the 12% of the population that's not connected to the grid. Um, still, because they have a very centralised planning system, it's basically based on the, on the continental USA system, and they were saying, you know, they... They really have to look much more now at what, how much, you know, what are the, what is the demand for energy? How do they tailor services to that? And they don't have the planning tools at the moment to do that because they have this very centralised system. So again, I think the more we can, we can turn it around and look at, okay, what are the, what kinds of energy services do people need to meet their development needs and do it a bit more that that way up for access? I think think we get a lot further. Um, and then I think again, it, it points to the whole need for this much more multi-stakeholder support for the national energy discussion. There's a kind of national energy discussion about how to meet the, you know, the economic policy objectives, how to meet, how to meet the access objectives, for example. That, that, that's all I'd say. So, yes, we need more support, uh, more advocacy around having this actually evidence-based national energy discussion. Um, I, th I think we are out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and for coming. And let's give a round of applause to our panelists.